And we're going. Okay. Everybody's all set? Okay, all right. So, hi. Uh, thanks for coming out today. My name is Ben. This is Amber. And we're talking about homebrewing for hackers. So I want to set the, uh, the stage of what you guys should expect today. Um, so we're here to share our interests with the community. And this is definitely going to be a break from the technical stuff. Um, and honestly, we're a little surprised that this talk even got accepted. Um, <laughs> so, hey. Um, so, you know, just to, to also set the expectations. Uh, sorry, no zero days. If you came to this talk expecting zero days, you probably came to the wrong place, uh, you would think. Um, so anyway, we're going to give you a zero day, we think. Um, so this is how to get a DerbyCon talk accepted. Uh, so first of all, tell people you will give them free beer, right? Um, name drop in 80, regardless if you know him or not. Um, spend, but seriously, spend some time thinking about uh, what your submission says, and spend times on, on on all of the parts, even the parts that the you know the attendees will see, um, won't see. Uh, so we actually uh, submitted our, uh, we posted our submission online if you want to read it, just to see how this talk got accepted. Um, but don't rule out the stable talks, right? There's actually, you know, I think maybe a little less competition. Um, demo something, and if you can, open source something that you demo, right? DerbyCon loves open source. Um, give away free stuff, so we have some free stuff we're going to give away today. And uh, use Unicode, uh, like a floating boss. And uh, say yes to DerbyCon hugs, regardless if you want them or not. This is kind of the culture here. And uh, don't be shy, just submit something. You have a better chance of getting something accepted than you would think. Um, so quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to learn how to make booze. So how many homebrewers in the crowd? Wow, okay, you guys are awesome. Okay, and uh, if we say something wrong, go ahead and correct us, right? Um, okay, history and legal fun, we'll talk a little bit about the prohibition, that's what that picture's from, and then our open source project at the end. So we have a lot of material we're gonna cover, um, so we're just gonna kinda try to keep moving through it. So I'm gonna give you the beer chemistry 101, right? So we start with yeast, yeast is probably the most important thing, and we're gonna feed it some sugar. And that's going to give us yeast poop, right? But that yeast poop is actually awesome because it is alcohol and carbon uh, dioxide, which is exactly what we want in our beer. So that's good yeast poop, right? <laughs> and um, beer is actually one of like man's oldest inventions, you know, up there with like fire and stuff. And uh, it was probably just an accident that we made it. Um, so making booze is really, really easy. If you haven't homebrewed, that's like half of you in the crowd. Um, it's you, you can't really mess it up too much. All you got to do is make it taste good, right? So that's what the rest of the talk is going to be about. Um, and just quick disclaimer, we're not like beer experts. We're hobbyists. Everyone has this slide, right? Um, there's lots of opinions on the internet about the right way to do things, and uh, people disagree fiercely on what that right way to do it is. Um, so there's always room to improve, probably better ways of doing things, and this is what we've been doing lately, um, but we keep adapting things and keep changing things. So I'm going to hand it over to Amber uh, to talk about the steps of making beer. Okay, this is probably everyone's favorite part. <laughs> so open a beer to get started. Uh, so a good idea is to figure out if you have everything. The worst part is like getting halfway through and realizing you are missing something. So it's a good idea to just get an idea of what uh, you need and have it ready to go. Uh, this is just an example of what you might find in a kit you might buy online. So you're going to have some dry malt, liquid malt. Uh, yeast isn't pictured there because we actually did a starter on this one. And then um, the hops and some... Uh, malts. Uh, so sanitization is one of the most important things uh, because you want your yeast to win. Um, uh, do not use soap. Soap is really bad for um, beer. Uh, we use star sand because it's worked really well for us. Some people use bleach. I don't know how well that works. Um, and so there's a, a couple different ideas, but star sand seems to work really well for us. Uh, another thing, don't use scratch pads. You open up when you put scratches in, you get bacteria. That ruins everything. It, you can't get it out then. So another kind of key thing that we really don't uh, normally think about is clean up right away. Don't let things sit overnight. Just clean up right away. It's so much easier. Um, of course, sanitization is so important. Want your because there's yeast around us at all times. While yeast gets in, you don't get the same type of beer. So yeah, sanitization is so important. Um. Oh, okay. So, I'll just, <laughs> so okay. Uh, just a pro tip: um, if you ever end up getting sucked into a time vortex and end up having to live the rest of your life out in the medieval ages, don't drink the water, right? Uh, but you're better probably you're, you're you're better off drinking some beer or wine. And our question to you guys is why? What do you think? Kills bacteria. Yeah, kills bacteria. So you want to come up and get a beer kit? 
Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> <laughs> so we got, we got three beer kits here. Maybe. No, you're right. Yeah, okay. So we got uh, an IPA a kit. We got a uh, wheat kit. And then this is a stout. Okay. Well, you can. Uh, yeah, so go ahead and grab the IPA kit. Um, so these uh, these kits we made, um, these, uh, I, I guess we should give you a little background. When you give a DerbyCon talk, you get a $200 honorarium. So we decided we might as well give that back to the community, and we made these kits. These are kits that we decided uh, we thought were all the proper uh, ingredients and equipment you would need for a one-gallon starter kit. So, And they also come with the ingredients, so it's everything you need to make in there. So go ahead. Okay, so start, step two is to get the bo water hot. So start the boiling process. Uh, you're not actually going to get it to a full boil, but really close. Um, so a little more water results in better hop utilization. Um, it's always a good idea to read the directions at this step. Uh, that way you don't miss anything because in this step, that are, I read a lot of it, and then Ben added the wrong the hops at the wrong time. So we actually messed this one up. Um, so after that, steeping the grain. So just throw it in the bag, grain bag. A uh, nice little idea is to tie the grain bag to the side of the kettle. That way you can get it out without scorching your fingers. Uh, took us a little while to figure that one out. Uh, a nice thing about during the boil, stick some the liquid malt in some hot water in the sink. It's a lot easier to pour. You don't have to sit a, stick a spoon in there and try to scrape it all out. It just pours all out. Uh, so we're letting it warm up. Uh, take the pot off the boiler before you um, dump the uh, liquid malt in there. That way you don't scorch it on the bottom. It's a good idea to like have one person stirring. Ben's, of course, taking the photo right now. Uh, and then the other person pour, uh, pouring because then you can stir it and not get it scorched on the bottom. And at this point, you have wool, uh, wart. And so now we boil it. This is what we call the danger zone because we've let it boil over a couple times. So and it happens <laughs> really, really fast. Yeah, so and, an eye on it. and it's a mess to clean up. It's kind of a pain. So kind of keep an eye on it for the first half. It kind of calms down after that. There's a pro tip there. If your surface to boil over, spray cold water on it. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's yeah. a good idea. Okay. Um, so at, during the boil is when you're going to add your hops. So um, the first part of hops you put in is uh, bittering hops. So that's kind of the flavor, the bitter part of the, the beer you're tasting. And towards the end, you're going to add aromic hops, which are like more of the smell of the beer you're uh, getting off of that. Um, it's kind of handy to have a food scale just because a lot of times they give you in uh, one ounce packages. And sometimes you add like half an ounce to start with and then a half an ounce later. And then sometimes they also give you a little extra. They don't normally short you on hops. So it's just a little something kind of handy. That way you uh, have the exact amount. That's not too important, though. Um, cooling and aerating. So if you want to take a really long time, you can just put ice and water in the sink and let it sit for a really long time and stir it. Uh, a wart chiller is really handy and cuts the time down to maybe 20 minutes tops. So it just runs hot, cold water through a pipe in there. And at this point, um, everything that touches the wart must be completely sanitary. So Sarah Sand is kind of handy at this point, especially in a spray bottle, because you can just spray everything. Um, so we're getting it ready for primary fermentation. Yeast needs oxygen to live, so we need to dump. Uh, we just dump it into the container. If you're seeing bubbles, you're probably getting uh, pretty good aeration. Um, and you're also going to want to get up to a certain volume because we initially started with about three gallons in the kettle because it's not feasible to do five gallons in there. It's just too heavy to move around. Um, but you don't want to add too much water because we're trying to get to a specific starting gravity or original gravity. And this just is how to kind of read it. You're reading at the below the, at the bottom of the miscus. Uh, you're trying to get it. This is just reading of how much sugar is in there. And so you'll have on your sheet um, how much or what it needs to be at, and you just add water to get it up to there, slow <laughs> increments. Um, pitching the yeast, we actually did a yeast starter, which is like doing a little microbrew beforehand. Uh, normally, we just dump the dry yeast in there. We've never had it not start, so it's worked out pretty well for us. And of course, if you forget the yeast, there is no beer. <laughs> um, and then, of course, you need to keep everything else else out and you're going to let the CO2 out but not let oxygen in and so you're going to uh, we use 
we've been using moonshine lately for that process, um, <laughs> for letting, for filling the airlock. Uh, don't use water, you'll get an infection. Well, you, there's a possibility of it, because sometimes the air temperature might change and it might pull some, what, some of what's in the airlock into your brew. So it's a good idea to use star sand, which doesn't hurt the yeast or hurt you in low quantities, um, or um, <laughs> alcohol of some other sort. Um, and this, you can actually see the, it's bubbling away. Uh, you sh this is actually the next morning, so it does not take very long. If it's been a couple days and you don't see anything, there's something wrong, you need to look into it. A good idea is to remember if you put yeast in it. And it doesn't take very long to get going. And now you have the flat beer. Uh, so we do, we normally do a secondary fermentation, but at this stage you could technically bottle it and drink it shortly after that. Um, but mainly the secondary is to get rid of the krausen and the dead yeast at the bottom. Um, so that, that's pretty much the goal of this part. Um, it's also an idea that we've gotten into like putting other things into it. So like putting oaking, oaks in there. Uh, you can add some bourbon at this point, uh, add fruit or do dry hopping if you like more hops in there. Um, at this point, a lot, it's, there's a lot of alcohol in it, so you don't have to worry about it being so clean. It's still always a good idea, but like the dry hops, you don't really need to boil them, just throw them in there. Um, you're also going to take another hydrometer reading. Um, this is just a quick uh, formula to get the uh, alcohol by volume. It's kind of a nice idea, because sometimes it varies widely. We've gotten stuff up to like 6 7%, and then we have stuff that's really low, too. Uh, the second formula is for higher gravity stuff. Um, we've had a lot of, we've gotten into doing wines and stuff, so it's a little better formula for that kind of thing. Uh, quick idea on carbonating. So we normally do bottling, but kegging's a nice option. Uh, you're using natural carbonation with the bottling, so you're just giving the yeast some food and then they'll create some CO2 inside the bottle. So it takes a little while for that to build up inside the bottle. So you have two or three weeks. Kegging, since you're forcing CO2, you have a little less time you have to wait. Uh, it's cheaper for the balls because a lot of you probably drink beer here. And if you just hold on to the bottles that are um, not twist offs, you can just reuse them. Just wash them out really well. Um, it's a little more work with the bottles because you have to sanitize all of them. Uh, and then you also have the chance of bottle bombs. Uh, we've never had one blow up because the headspace is so important. It's, uh, air compresses much better than uh, liquids, so if you leave some headspace in there, it can compress there and you don't have to worry about a bottle bomb. But sometimes they happen. You might have not let fermentation finish at, in time. So a good idea is we put everything in a plastic tub. If one blows up, it's in the tub. It's easy to clean up. You don't have glass everywhere. And then, of course, if you use a keg, you have beer on tap. Um, and then, of course, you can always just repeat the entire process. Now you have a nice amount of beer started. Uh, so we've kind of gotten... I think we're missing... Oh, we're missing something. Oh, well. Um, we've gotten into doing uh, uh, wine and mead, which is honey wine. Uh, a lot of this equipment you can use to uh, make uh, wines and root beer sodas. So uh, the thing I like about wine, though, and especially honey wine, because it's my favorite, um, is there's less ingredients, so you have a little more play on what you want to make. I've made up my own recipes at this point with the honey wines because I don't have to worry about uh, It's a little less ingredients, of course. And so I just pick out a fruit, throw it in with some water, a couple other chemicals to make sure it breaks down properly, and uh, when... The only other thing is pH is kind of a little more critical because uh, there's acids in fruit. And then the health of the yeast is also up there more because honey does has complex sugars, not simple sugars. And so it's a little harder to break down. And so they don't have as much food to start out with. I'll hand it back over to Ben for a little history. Okay. So uh, believe it or not, uh, there was a time when we couldn't brew um, in the U.S. And 
Most people called this prohibition, but it was also called the noble experiment. Uh, and this was because at the time the sentiment um, was that drinking was becoming this nationwide scourge, right? And there was a lot of lobbying um, by the Anti-Saloon League, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and quite a few other dry advocates. And I believe also the KKK was an advocate of not drinking, which might be surprising. But um, the uh, uh, actually, I mean, this, this, you know, turned into something that Congress ratified. It was the 18th Amendment. Um, and then the next day, prohibition was uh, in place. Um, and prohibition banned the manufacture, sale, or transport of intoxicating liquors. And uh, note that that doesn't mean that it was actually illegal to drink. It was just that you couldn't manufacture, uh, sell it, or transport it. Um, and intoxicating liquors was an intentionally vague term at the time uh, because they decided that the state and federal uh, future laws would redefine that. Um, and this also allowed for scientific, industrial, and religious uses of alcohol. Um, so most people thought that this just meant hard, hard liquor, right? Your vodkas, your, your whiskeys. Um, and we actually saw things like beer industries advocating for prohibition. Um, and if you're wondering why, it's because it's eliminating their competition, right? Everyone's got to drink beer now. Um, and so that makes sense until the Volstead Act came along to enforce prohibition. And the Volstead Act was named after, I believe, Andrew Volstead, which was the leader of the Anti-Saloon League, who had a much stricter definition of what intoxicating liquors would be. And this actually turned out to be anything above half a percent, right? So beer was completely out of the question at this point. Um, and so we see things like businesses getting creative, which is kind of a fun way um, to get around prohibition, right? Um, so if you're an alcohol business during prohibition, how do you survive? So we see Anheuser-Busch starts making soft drinks, right? Because it's all the same equipment. Um, but they also start selling brewer's yeast and homebrew kits, right? Because it's illegal to homebrew, but it's not illegal to sell the ingredients. So um, same, same thing along the lines. Uh, wine vineyards start selling what they call raisin cakes. And these raisin cakes came with kind of fun little warnings like, do not let these raisins soak in water. Do not let this water soak in a jug for 21 days. <laughs> Otherwise, fermentation may occur, right? And um, so this is actually a picture of a card that would come in a box of raisins. And this one's even much more explicit. It's just instructions directly how to make wine from those grapes, right? So totally illegal, right? People are just kind of getting around the ways. And if you have this idea in your mind, if you haven't tried home brewing, you might wonder, like, am I going to go blind? Am I going to brew something up that makes me go blind? Short answer is no. And that's because we have this stereotype from prohibition about uh, all these people getting sick and dying from all this, like, underground alcohol, right? Uh, and really, that's because um, there is wood alcohol, which is methanol. Uh, ethanol is the alcohol we like. Methanol is not the alcohol we like, right? Um, and methanol is incredibly toxic. In fact, when you uh, start to metabolize it in your body, it turns first into formaldehyde and then second into formic acid. Formic acid. Yeah, which is uh, very dangerous to the human nervous system. Um, so this is made by distilling wood, which just seems like a bad idea in the first place. It tastes just like alcohol, so you can't tell the difference. It looks like alcohol. Um, and the anti, uh, I don't know which group it was, but the industrial um, uh, industries had to uh, start denaturing industrial alcohol so people wouldn't just buy industrial alcohol and drink that. And one of the early ways that they did that was by putting methanol in it, right? So it became a very deadly poison to people. Um, and then we also saw people just making wood alcohol and selling it uh, to these kind of unregulated underground markets. Um, and so that became incredibly toxic. In fact, just a spoonful is enough to kill an adult human, uh, an adult male. Um, and then this kind of became a game of chemists denaturing and then renaturing industrial alcohols. And they kept kind of playing a game of making deadlier and deadlier denaturing uh, agents uh, that the chemists had trouble um, renaturing the alcohol again. Um, and if you were a rich person during the time, you didn't really have to worry uh, because you either bought from a country club, which was allowed to pre-stock a whole bunch of alcohol before prohibition went into effect, because it's not illegal to drink it. Um, if you bought it before, that's okay. Or you would drink with the chemist, right? And the chemist would drink first. And if he didn't die, you were safe to go ahead and drink. But if you're a poor person, you didn't have that luxury. Um, and during prohibition, there was only a market for hard stuff probably because it's easier to transport a small amount of liquid than a large amount of liquid for like a beer, right? And if you drank something, you probably drank a lot of it. Um, in fact, the 
the amount of just plain old regular alcohol-related deaths skyrocketed during Prohibition. More and more people were drinking during Prohibition. Uh, before Prohibition, drinking in a bar was kind of like a saloon. It's kind of the Old West. It's a kind of a male-only place. But now it's an unregulated underground market. Women and children are drinking it. It changed the whole drinking scene. So kind of an interesting time period. Um, so homebrewing today, homebrewing is totally legal today in all 50 states. Um, prohibition was it repealed in 1933, went into effect in 1919. Meanwhile, women got the right to vote, and they changed the presidential term uh, to begin in January instead of April. Um, yeah, I don't care about that point. But um, anyway, so the state laws vary widely. So that's something you still need to know because state laws still apply over the federal laws. Uh, Alabama, Alabama and Mississippi actually legalized homebrewing in 2013. So that's, you know, they just finally caught up. Um, and also, we actually wanted to homebrew a bunch of beer and just right. give it away, but uh, Kentucky does not allow us to give away free beer. So that's Yeah, why so you have to do it in a home. <laughs> um, so you're limited to 100 gallons per year uh, per person, federally, uh, up to 200 gallons per household. So if you can drink that much, go for it, but that's quite a few. Um, homebrewing cannot be sold, so we can't sell you homebrewing. Um, you need a license to own or operate distillation equipment, um, but getting that license uh, is actually pretty easy from what I've heard. So if you're interested in that, just pursue uh, uh, getting a license first. Um, now, we have another question for you guys, and this one has a reward. So uh, if you can't legally distill alcohol, and by distill alcohol I mean boil it, capture the vapor, condense it, and then save the alcohol, how else could you create a hard liquor? You already got one. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, removing water from like a wine or something like that. Yeah, so how would you do that, though? Uh, boiling. Yeah, but that's that's the regular distillation method, so, okay. Cold fermentation. Yeah, cold fermentation. So he raised his hand first, but yeah. That's how, like, BrewDog makes their very, very high gravity pay alcohol, which is 20, Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so come up and pick out a kit. We got a stout over here, and we got a... Uh, a wheat beer, yeah. So ingredients. So yeah. Um, so a couple of ways. Uh, definitely not legal advice. You're probably still gonna get in trouble if you try to do it and sell it or whatever. But um, you can try to freeze concentrate it. Depending how cold and how fast you can get it, you can actually get between like 15 and 90 percent. Um, and another way we, uh, you could try is by picking a, a high yield yeast that's kind of um, resistant to alcohol, or by adding sugar as and keeping the yeast healthy. And uh, then you're kind of artificially selecting the healthy yeast. Um, so that's not going to yield as much, but you can, we've made uh, meads up to like 18%. So, and hopefully it would be kind of cool to go farther. Um, so eventually if you brew enough beers, you kind of find yourself saying, okay, we need a better system. And this is a conversation with my friend, Tim. Um, and he kind of says something along the lines of, you know, we should really start labeling things. And by we, I mean you. And um, that's just because I have all these bottles around. And I try to color code the caps, but eventually you kind of start recycling the colors on the caps. Um, so anyway, you want kind of a system to record your measurements um, and automatically compute your alcohol content. Because you've taken these measurements, I don't want to have to run the calculations every single time someone asks me how much alcohol is in this beer. Um, and the system that we built actually is uh, version controlled with Git, because why not? And uh, it's a web page that's hosted for free on GitHub um, and will deploy in just about five minutes. So all you have to do is go to the GitHub project, fork the project, um, and then edit a few, few files. You can add each brew by adding a markdown file. So markdown is very easy to edit by hand. Uh, you can do it all through the web browser in Git. Um, it's just a clean, simple theme. It's based off Jekyll uh, and supports a custom domain name and is customizable. So. Uh, this is our open source project. Um, in fact, I'll just pull it up because we have just a few minutes. Okay, so if you go to the home page, you can see all of our brews. We've done quite a few here. Um, you hover over each alcohol um, content here, and then uh, it shows you the calculation and our measurements. You can jump to each of these. This is the last one we brewed. I messed up the hop order, as Amber said, because I was taking too many pictures. Um, but anyway, this is just kind of a fun way. You can add comments and stuff. So if uh, you guys are looking for something like this, it's free. Just fork the project. Um, OK, so I think that's all we have. Um, so I'd like to say definitely thank you guys for coming out. This is a huge audience for a very non-technical subject. 
And um, I think that uh, hacking and brewing is kind of a win as uh, evidence of half the audience is into that. Um, and if you're kind of into that, there's two other conferences you might want to check out. There's one in Belgium called BrewCon, um, which is all about uh, brewing and tech hacking. And then there's one in Chicago called ThoughtCon, and they hold a home brewing competition at a bar. So that's kind of a fun thing. Um, and if you guys want these slides, they're up on our sites um, and happy to take any questions. Oh, and you guys might be wondering, there's one more kit left. So if you guys look under your seats, someone has something taped to the bottom of their seat. And if no one finds it, you might want to slide over, you might want to, slide over to a different seat. <laughs> Yeah, the people that have it, I think. Nope. <laughs> I didn't think there'd be more than one thing. Awkward. Yeah, awkward. <laughs> it should be somewhere in the middle because the front always kind of gets some evidence. You know, it gets, uh, gets some, some chance to win first. I think you taped it too well. Maybe I taped it too well, yeah. Ah, yeah, so it just uses the basic equation right now, which is, I mean, the both equations are within a tenth of a percent of each other. Um, but yeah, you can, I mean, it's, it's you can add more measurement categories if you want. So we added one on my site, on my, my fork of the master, uh, which uh, records the, um, the pH of the stuff, because that, we didn't add that for beer, because normally you're already within the right pH zones for the yeast, but. Yeah, that's been my biggest thing is I know there's a lot of commercial ones, yeah. 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 So we kind of, I mean, the, the what's on Master now is kind of the basic thing. It's kind of aimed at beer, but it's got just basically the original and final.